Welcome back for another live stream. Blunting the effects of stress. Critical. Uh, I put up on the board today that it's a killer. Blunting the effects of stress. This word right here, it's a word that it has incredible tentacles and potential for destruction in our lives. Physically, emotionally, psychologically, it is a killer. It brutalizes our health. Guesstimates run anywhere from 75 to 80 percent, 75 to 85 percent of physician visits, hospital visits, um, hospitalizations, ER visits. Certainly, God forbid I fall, I trip, I, I, I break a finger or I fracture a, a forearm. I'm not talking about that. The bulk of issues that we deal with medically today have a root or a genesis in chronicity of condition, chronic conditions that can be dire related directly back to some form of stress. Digestively, inflammatory bowel diseases, circulatory inflammatory types of issues, all, all of them have some degree of input and effect from stress. Now certainly my diet plays a role and there's other factors, but to not understand that this is a key component, it's a huge cog in the wheel, it makes the system go, would be foolish. So how do we help you today? How do we teach you? The, one of the other videos that we just did, uh, we talked to you about the effects of stress and we went into detail about how it impacts negatively your health. So today, um, I'm going to reiterate that just a bit for many of you that maybe this is your first view at understanding stress and how it affects our lives. But I really want to uh, get you to understand a couple of things here. Number one, you've got to have an understanding of what stress is. You've got, you're going to have to understand that it's going to take some work to be able to counteract it. Um, it'll require some discipline on your behalf, some commitment for you to work at this. Um, so you see how these are all un intertwined. And ultimately, your coping <clears throat> mechanisms, is it all in deep breathing? Is it all in exercise? Is it all in changing your diet, um, improving your sleep? Well, we'll talk about all that. But is it all in this? Is this something that you do alone, that you stand alone, and you become self-sufficient in? Or do we understand that we need some help? And I'm going to zero in on the fact that you and I, I know I do, I'm going to make the assumption that you do because you're human just like me. I came from dust, so do you, did you, and we're going back to dust, this physical body. But our spirit man lives on forever. And our spirit man is... Um, Without question, God desires, I've, I've done some teachings, we're going to talk about it today, we're going to go back to the book of Genesis, and Adam sins, Eve sinned, they fall away from God, they hide from God, and God says to Adam, where are you? Where are you? Adam said, I was ashamed, you know, in essence, my, my better half here made me do this, and um, I hid from you. To me, it's a direct, God didn't have to ask Adam where he was. Adam had withdrawn from God. It's a clear picture that God desires fellowship with us. Yes, he created this universe, the galaxies, this earth that we live on. He hung, Jesus says, hung the stars in the sky, the psalmist said, and called them by name. But he desires fellowship with you and I. He didn't need to do that. He desires. He created us for fellowship. Yeah, we're to serve him, but we're created for fellowship. So I want to start off with you understanding that your help has to be rooted not in self-help. Because if I taught you and gave you uh, indications that this was self-help, this was self-sufficiency, I would be totally wrong. This will fall on its face. It will not help you. So you can agree or disagree with the spiritual aspect of this. Just hear me out. Just hear me out. Let me go read to you out of the book of Isaiah, and then we're going to get into blunting the effects of stress. But this is part of blunting the effects. The book of Isaiah, chapter 50, and it says, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the words of his servant? Number one, we've got to learn to fear him. 
reverence him. Number two, it says, let one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. One who walks in the dark. So when we are in darkness or we are in need of direction, we can either, you'll see here, pitch your own light or you can ask for God to light your path. But now all of you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, go. That's what God says, go. Walk in the light of your fire and the torch that you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. You say, wow, what? I thought this was a loving God that you taught me. Yeah, it is. But this is a powerful scripture that says, you want to, want to do it your way. You want to light your own path. You go right on ahead and do that. And as you do that, you will fall on your face because what you have done, you have withdrawn from me. Let me light your path. Let me enlighten where you need to go. It is about trusting in him. Let me give you a couple other quick scriptures. 51 verse 3, and still in Isaiah. The Lord will surely comfort Zion, and he will look with compassion on all of her ruins. Verse 5, my righteousness draws near speedily, my salvation is on the way, and my arm will be, bring justice to the nations. Verse 6 or 7 here, but my salvation will last forever, my righteousness will never, never fail. Hear me, you who know what is right. See, we, when, we have, when we have the Spirit of God within us, we're able to discern right. Those of you that, if you're listening to this and you know what I'm speaking to you is right. Listen with your heart. You people who have taken my instruction to heart, do not fear reproach of mere mortals or be terrified by their insults, but my righteousness will last forever, my salvation throughout all generations. I will put my words in your mouth and covered you with the shadow of my hand. I who set the heavens in place, who laid the foundations of the earth, and who say to Zion, you are my people. Now we have to understand in biblical context of that time, this was a word, a message for the everlasting salvation of Zion. That God was committed to his people, the children of Israel. He was committed to those that love him and were committed to him. That's what that's a message of. But then we also have to understand there's an interpretation for you and I today. God's word was just not applicable in the days of Isaiah as Isaiah prophesied this. It's applicable to you and I today. There's a biblical, there's a, an eternal context, and it always points to Christ Jesus. And then there's a literal interpretation for us to be able to understand. This is saying if you trust in yourself, in your own torch, in your own light, you will fall on your face. Two concepts quickly. We learn from Adam. When we fall away from God or we sin or we do wrong or we mess up, run to him, don't run and hide. God says, where are you? I want a fellowship with you. Over here we see God says, you're in the dark. You need direction. You light your own torch. You light your own path. And I'm going to, I'll withdraw my favor from you. You let me light your torch. Let me light your path. He's saying, I got you. I got you. All right. I hope that encourages you. I have one more uh, scripture component that we'll close with before we're done. Let's, let's move back over to how do we then, we already clarified that you're going to need help. And I believe it's with the presence of God and by his spirit that ultimately you are going to need to seek help and how to deal with stress. But now it's for me also to teach you that there has to be an understanding that you're going to have to commit and work at changing the processes. Stress, why is it? Why would I say it's a killer? Well, I could, um, I could spend an hour just defining of how when stress is high, and crazy things are going on in your life that you have, first of all, this, um, what we would term kind of this alarm range of stress, high cortisol. You're just punching out cortisol. You're punching out noradrenaline, adrenaline or epinephrine and norepinephrine. You're punching out all these stress hormones. This is where most of us are for a good portion of our lives. Working two jobs, um, raising a family, uh, trying to work and raise a family, going to school, raising a family, 
maybe taking care of sick uh, elderly parents. Maybe you have um, a lot of other commitments, work and job. We're, we're, I often say, look at this, you know, I'm, I'm doing this teaching and, and I got this cell phone. Like, what? How ridiculous. Like, what am I going to miss in this span of time here? But are, seriously, you're on your way to work, texts, f- phones, phones, c- f- cells ringing. You get to work, you got other things going on, you're getting texts from something else, so you need to respond to it. Go to your email, you got another three or four emails that you need to deal with. Later, within an hour, you got multiple emails you need to deal with. Then your phones ring. Our lives are busy, complicated, and we are under the gun, and we are in huge big-time alarm phases. This is the precursor, and what this begins to happen, it imbalances your blood sugars. It can begin to allow you to be more frayed and disjointed in your thinking. It is breaking down your muscles. Literally, you become catabolic. It's easier for you to add fat because of the stress hormones that are being punched out. Um, Your sleep many times becomes distressed because of this alarm phase that we're in. And we're just punching out all these stress hormones. So that's where many of us are sometimes for years. So you could be viewing this in your 20s and you could be in your 30s. You could be in your 40s and you could still be in this alarm phase where you're just cranking out. Always remember that God has made our bodies amazingly, amazingly adaptive. And it will fight through this stress and it will battle through these alarm phases. The next phase, um, what we would term the resistance phase. And now what's happening is the body's starting to kick back. It's, it's rebelling against you. It's beginning to kind of tell you, I can't cope with this level of distress anymore. Now we start to see symptoms. I could have digestive disorders. This is after that long period of alarm phase. High end, high race, high output, high stress hormone output. Maybe it hasn't affected you physically yet. But you, you just sense it. Man, my heart feels like it races sometimes. I've, but geez, I had like three days. I had to get this project done. I had this thing at church to get done. I had this situation at work. And, um, you know, with my family, I had to move my parents. I, man, I feel like I've been running on adrenaline. You have. And the body's in this alarm, this pungent push of stress hormones. And that's what's getting you through. The, the, the key here is, is that you're supposed to be pulsing this over blocks of time, these stress, high stress phases, these alarm phases. But the reality of it is we're punching it out like this. This is like on a daily basis. See, it's continuous. It's not blips and blocks of time. So now in this resistance phase, a lot of things can begin to happen. I can uh, begin to become just maybe a little tired or more fatigued. I need more coffee and more energy drinks. And that's what a lot of Americans do. High caffeine, high sugar. Um, I I develop some digestive problems. Doc puts me on Prilosec, Nexium. Um, I I went to the doc as well and they said maybe my blood pressure is beginning to rise a little bit. What's with that? Every once in a while I get these heart palpitations. What's with that? You're beginning to move into more of a resistance phase where the body is now beginning to um, literally resist or talk back to you. You're beginning to have situations arise that the body is saying, I can't tolerate this alarm phase that you have me under continuously. And I begin to move through, the body starts fighting back. Blood pressure I am going to be a little more driven. I need coffee. I need energy drinks. I'm more fatigued. I've got digestive problems. I could have sleep disturbances. Um, I I even find at times that I'm a little anxious. Um, I I don't like being around crowds. And once again, I I go to my family physician. He's saying, well, geez, you know, or she's saying, "I, I don't know. You know, if you're really having some difficulty here, you know, maybe, maybe we need to put you on a little bit of Paxil or Lexapro. You know, one of these SSRI drugs. Um, I, maybe, uh, hey, if you're really having trouble sleeping, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give you, you know, just give you 30, 30 in a month. You know, you just take one of these Zantac at, be- or excuse me, Xanax at bedtime, helps you sleep. 
So you see the resistance phase, okay? And, I, and there's so much to this, and I am not going to get into it because I, I could get into how cortisol rises and then DHEA um, rises with it along with these other stimulatory hormones. And, and then what happens from there is then that cortisol continues to spike and unfortunately DHEA begins to drop and it creates imbalances. But I, I think I want to stick to the practical aspects of this. So now we have, there, there are, there's multiple phases, but the three basic phases, alarm, resistance, exhaustion. Then we move into kind of the exhaustion phase. And all this really means is now the body is, is, is saying to you, not only am I resisting the level of stress that you have me under, I am breaking down. I'm, I'm breaking down now. So I, I could begin to develop signs and symptoms. For example, osteoporosis is an issue. I develop insomnia, panic, and anxiety disorders, full-blown. I need something. I can't get through the day. I had to pull off the side of the road. I, I, know, I, I couldn't breathe. I was pressure on my chest. I felt like I was having a heart attack. Um, you become less resilient. You become less resilient to the stressors. Remember now, this is the exhaustion. This is phase three. I, I, I don't have the resilience to get through some things. I don't cope. I lose my coping mechanisms. I'm short. I'm ill-tempered, easily aggravated. I'm really feeling like I'm starting to break down. I, I feel like I'm losing muscle mass. Uh, I'm getting a, getting a little chubby in through the middle. I'm gaining some weight in through the middle. I can't get up in the morning. Awakening is a problem. I feel like I could sleep all day. I'm fatigued. You know, some folks roll into a chronic fatigue, which is layers of other issues on top of this. This gives you a little bit of an overview. This is only touching on some of the bases, not all of them. What we clearly see from here in these exhaustion phases then is where folks many times begin to have even their neurotransmitters, uh, their brain neurotransmitters imbalanced. And, and now I could have some full-blown depression or I could just develop some low-grade dysthymia which is kind of a low-grade depression. Obviously then, in most cases, full-blown anxiety disorders, I am having panic attacks. So this is not, I don't believe we're just born with panic attacks. I don't know that we're just born with depression. You could have some genetic leanings. You could have some inborn errors of metabolisms with folate, methyl donating groups that makes, put you at a higher risk that will open this door but then what allows the door to be completely opened up is what's going on in your life. And if I am not raising a standard to cope with these stressors and blunt the effects of this stress in my life. So Josiah might say, you just got to chill. Right? Chill, man. You just got to chill. Easy. Just got to chill, man. And right, in most cases, we'd like to be able to say that. And we'd like to believe that's the only way. Most people, but Most times I'm saying that and I need to be telling it to myself. That's exactly right. How often, and I'm finding this out, I'm sitting in a consult and I'm telling folks, you're overloaded, you're overwhelmed, you got way too much on your plate, and I really should be talking to myself, like Josiah just said. I need to be taking the chill pill. I, I, I need to be praising and worshiping God more. I need to be in his word more. I need to be doing some deep breathing. I do exercise. But the, I need to be instituting more of the, the list that I had up there at the beginning because you will go from the alarm phase, no doubt, to the more of a resistance phase where the body starts talking back to you and saying, I'm trying to cope with this, but you're pushing me. I can't do this things are starting to happen, I'm going to start breaking you down now. I don't want to do this to you. I'm not doing this on purpose, but you're not blunting any of these effects and you're assaulting me all the time. I'm resisting you, but I think you're going to have a problem. God forbid. Lord, God forbid. And then lastly, we can start to move to this exhaustion phase, which we talked about here. And now... 
um, I'm sickly. I've got mood disorders. I'm depressed. I've got hypoglycemic tendencies. My blood sugar drops. Many times you'll find folks in these exhaustion phases are reaching for more sugary foods, carbohydrate-based foods, salty foods. <clears throat> they have more food cravings and sugar cravings. You will typically begin to develop more immune dysfunction. I get sick easily, colds, flus, viruses. I get everything that comes down the pike. I am more prone to allergies. I can't believe this. I'm 40 years old and I developed allergies. I can't even cut my grass. My head just explodes. Eyes run. My nose runs. Itchy. Oh, I can't do it. My neighbors are cutting their grass. I got to go inside. Excuse me. Folks say, well, how did... How did this happen? I never had allergies. I'm in my 30s. I've got horrific allergies now. And when I try to explain to them some of this stuff, you know, I get, I get like the beady eyes, like, what? I, th I thought I'd, can't you just give me something for this? Okay. I hear you talk about quercetin, dihydrate, and, you know, sinistat and dehist. And can't you do it? Well, yeah, I, I can, and I will. But you need to understand your body's talking back to you. You might be in this resistance phase and the body's starting to break down and some of these symptoms, there's not one point where it just happens, but now I'm starting to have more allergies, more sinus problems. <clears throat> I've got GERD and reflux and the doc said, you have too much acid, so therefore you're on, really, do you? Do you? Um, I, I'm, I'm, boy, if I didn't know better, you know, my... My brother-in-law, I know he's taking a medication for some of the stress that he's under. I, phew, I feel like I need that stuff. You see, you start to transfer over, and you, you, you'll eventually break through this wall, and you move into this exhaustion phase where you're sickly, you're breaking down, you're gaining weight, your blood pressure's rising, your triglycerides are rising. I, I, I got to eat food sometimes middle of the day. I am craving carbs. I can't sleep at night. I've gotten insomnia. I used to sleep like a baby. My head used to hit the pillow and I was gone. I mean, literally, God forbid, the house would have to blow up before I'd wake up. Now, you know, if I hear the cats rustling, I'm awake. People become light sleepers. I've ex personally, I've experienced this. So I speak from experience here. And, we, and I, you know... I think I'm Superman. No, I'm not. I'm mortal man. I'm not Superman. I'm not capable of functioning at this high-end, like, intensive, you know, wheel that I've been on for 35 years plus. Just intense, hard, banging out six and seven days a week. What, am I crazy? Yeah, I think I am. Because it's taking an effect on me. I speak from experience in this area. And I'm, I'm passing personal experience and I'm passing on knowledge-based experience here to tell you that if we don't begin to do some things to blunt these effects, you will go from the alarm and you're on high alert all the time. You'll begin to move to the resistance. Body starts talking back in little ways to you. Things start happening. I start getting more symptoms. But eh, I'm 40-something now. What's the big number? This didn't happen in three months. This is usually over years. And then eventually, God forbid, you start moving over and you start breaking through this barrier and you start moving into the exhaustion phase. Okay? Makes sense. Um, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? This is the, this is the big, this is the troubling part because... Uh, why I started you and prefaced that it was going to take work and commitment and time and um, you being very analytical and God fearing and God, what do I need to do? How do I need to rest? How do I need to step back? Rest is not a bad thing. It should not be evil in our vocabulary. We've got to be careful of this, of, of, for many of us, these obsessions that we feel like... <coughs> in order for us to be productive, excuse me, that I have to be doing all of the time. It'll get us into trouble. So when I start talking about, you know, how do we deal with and how do we begin to blunt some of the effects, I think it starts with some low-level physical activity and some exercise. 
And it's incredible, it, it's, it's, it's very critical because exercise helps to blunt some of the effects of stress, blunt some of the effects of the cortisol and the stimulatory adrenaline, noradrenaline that your body um, is, is, is producing, norepinephrine. Exercise can do that. Exercise is a balancer, physical activity. <clears throat> and it could be swimming, it could be walking, it could be getting on a stationary bike, but it must be something, it should be fairly consistent. And you don't do it to the point of exhaustion, but you've got to get blood flowing. It'll temper the stress hormones. It'll help you rebalance your neurotransmitters. It'll get oxygen flowing. Exercise is certainly your friend. Sleep. You move into that resistance phase, sleep problems become an issue. Now, when I start to have sleep issues, I don't make human growth hormone. <clears throat> I'm not adequately making melatonin because I'm cortisol dominant. Um, I, 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 what can I, what's the, what's the um, end result? I don't repair. So part of this, now that I'm not sleeping as a result of high stress and not learning to exercise and learning to step back in life, what's happening, I now begin to go into this poor repair mode, poor repair, physically start breaking down. So exercise, sleep, very, very critical. I would think, um, I, I should have used this one first, but um, I, I, if we don't talk about the diet, we'd be remiss. If I eat tons of carbs, a lot of breads, a lot of flours, a lot of sugars, <clears throat> lots of caffeine, um, I, I spike blood sugars very badly when I do these types of things as opposed to having blood sugars do this. Um, I really antagonize my adrenals under this scenario. So you've got to eat a diet that's more low glycemic load, lean protein, more vegetables, um, not get, get rid of some of the breads, cut back on the pastas and rice, don't spike your blood sugars, because every time I spike my blood sugars like this, I antagonize when I do this, and then when it drops the blood sugar, I am, I am asking for my adrenals to surge again. And that's the big problem, right? We're just putting out all these stress hormones to try to counteract. I'm asking for my body to do more than it's capable of. Alcohol is a problem I, firmly. Um, firmly believe alcohol is a problem here. And the sugars and the whites. We've got to make a conscious effort dietarily to begin to make some changes. With specifics with this, um, you may need to call and set up a time with our office because then we can step you through some very specific scenarios. But this gives you uh, a capsulated version of what I believe you should be after. So diet is critical, how I eat. Don't skip meals. Don't drink tons of caffeine. Don't eat one meal a day. I should be eating a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, I should start my day maybe with a protein smoothie if I'm too busy. What's wrong with some eggs and vegetables? And a, um, What's wrong with a piece of salmon or chicken breast with mixed greens at lunch and some vegetables and garbanzo beans on there? What's wrong with uh, apple um, raw nuts and, and, and maybe some hummus for snacks during the course of the day? What's wrong with a decent dinner that has protein and broccoli and cauliflower and a big mixed green salad, maybe a side of quinoa? What's wrong with that? Nothing. Quality snacks at night. Don't skip your meals. Diet plays a big role. Diet, physical activity. Um, I think that the two areas here then I'd like to just then talk about is rest, okay? Because I think rest is going to play um, a, a big, big role in deep breathing, You've got to deep breathe. You've got to learn to breathe where it's taking you three to four seconds to take in a breath. Slow, rhythmic taking in of the breath. Three to four seconds where you hold the breath. And then slow three to four seconds where you release. Intake, holding, releasing. And you can start with two or three if you can't do this. If you can eventually get it to four or five seconds, that's awesome. What does it do? It slows you down. You breathe more diaphragmatically. 
you exchange your gases better, CO2. You get more oxygen in. Uh, you know, one of the end results of that is you'll make serotonin, that feel-good hormone, more efficiently when you deep breathe. As we're under a lot of stress, we start to breathe in quippets. We breathe very short breaths. We don't expand our lungs. So you just... I mean, just doing that right there. It's very relaxing. You do it for two minutes, maybe a couple of times a day, maybe at a little break. Maybe if you're at work, you've got, you, you have to go to the bathroom, you take an extra minute or two just to deep breathe. It'll help you to cope, okay? On your way back to your office, on your way back, you know, you have to go out for a meeting. You sit in your car for two minutes, deep breathe. So if they think, people think you're crazy, I don't really. Don't have a cigarette, yeah, for sure. Deep breathe. Deep breathe, brother. Just don't deep breathe the, uh, the, uh, the tobacco, that's for sure. Resting. Uh, sometimes there's periods where we just need to just, just rest. Put check marks. I just need to, uh, I need to go take a walk. I need to not have maybe the TV on. Don't, don't just have nervous noise on all the time because somehow it makes you feel like uh, you have to hear something. Hear the voice of God. Go into a quiet area in your home. Turn the TV off. Turn some things off. I don't even care sometimes if you just take 15 to 20 minutes where you just lay down and close your eyes and even if you don't go to sleep. It's okay. Many of you have children and you have difficulties with your children. Many of you have children with, with developmental delays, spectrum disorders. You're under the gun constantly. You can, it, it, there's got to be 15, 20 minute periods where here where you can just take a breather. Many guys, um, I often tell folks, if you can just close your door, if you're in an office setting, again, just for 15 or 20 minutes, put your phone on hold for 15, just pull out your Bible, read one Psalm, take two minutes to breathe, and just sit there and close your eyes, even if it's for 10 minutes. It's not a bad thing. What you're doing is you're taking your adrenals out of this high pulse mode and you're spreading out the assaults. Now that may not seem like much to you, but getting more gaps in here between these stress assaults, because the stress assaults are coming, work, life, they're coming, you're giving your body a chance to recuperate. You're giving your adrenals a chance to, so if I'm driving them with sugar and energy drinks and tons of caffeine, six, seven, eight cups of coffee a day, a lot of carbs, a lot of sugary foods, white refined foods. I'm under stress. Do you see how the body literally can just start to break down? You got to learn to blunt it. Some rest, some quiet time. Your breathing plays a key role here. And then I think the next layer is how do you supplement? I mean, I love uh, a combination prep that we have that has rhodiola and relora in it, philodendron and magnolia zisiphus. Um, it's called adrenal essentials. Um, it's a powerful component because it helps you at, with an adrenal adaptogen. It helps you to adapt. <clears throat> P serine, more literature on phosphatidylserine, and we didn't bring it back, but phosphatidylserine. We use a 500 milligram standardized to 100 milligrams of P-serine content. A couple of these a day can very much help you with an inordinate high cortisol adrenal overload stress. It helps to blunt <clears throat> some of the effects of stress hormones that are put out. This coupled with high doses of DHA that's in something like the omega 800s is critical because the DHA and P-serine kind of synergize one another and help to neutralize some of the ravaging effects of stress. Our coenzyme B complete is another key player here <clears throat> because we just upgraded this component. So you still have the coenzyme versions, but we've got more pantothenic acid, some dimethylglycine, choline and acetol, a little bit of PABA, a little more, you've just got more support, more niacin. 
you've got more support in here and the right forms, quatrifolic, a folic acid to help you combat some levels of stress. <clears throat> Fifth, your buffered C is always going to be a part of how you combat stress. Certainly, you could throw some mood essentials into this. Now, this would be for folks, I would say, under high stress, in that alarm phase, even into the resistance phase. If you have moved all the way over kind of to the exhaustion phase, you might be beyond rhodiola. You might need some pregnenolone and DHEA sublingually is how we would do that along with your P-serine and DHA and coenzyme B. So you see it would change. So I don't know that this little scenario <clears throat> works across the board through all the different phases of adrenal blowout, overload, stress. But I'm trying to give you the quick overview from blunting from the basics in this kind of this hyperactive mode over to the resistance phase. This is still applicable you start crossing over to where I'm just starting to feel very exhausted. I'm blown out. Now we might need to even look at some cortisol time release. Definitely DHEA pregnenolone along with some of the other support. I think we're going to close and we're going to wrap. Blunting the effects of stress. It's critical. If you don't do it, um, at some point, your body begins to talk back to you. At some point, your body begins to have um, some huge distress. Let's see, we've got a question. I would like to know when an 11-year-old boy could be given for extreme stress, anger, and depression. He's 11 years of age. Um, there's anxiety, um, extreme stress. I'm not, I don't understand, 11-year-old under extreme stress, um, anger. Um, wow, now that's troubling to me that an 11-year-old has this almost insatiable anger issue. Um, I think you can start with some basic things. First of all, maybe he needs to be seen just to make sure there's not some underlying issues. I'd get him on some of the high doses of DHA, like our pro DHA. Might even want to try some mood essentials with him. And what about some cabinase? Cabinase more for the anxiety issues. Mood essentials to help him make some of his brain neurotransmitters. Um, <clears throat> The depression side of it could be a whole nother issue. Maybe at least, you know, the mood essentials could help with that. Maybe one of the coenzyme B completes. Cabinase coenzyme B completes, some mood essentials. You've got to get him on some high doses of the omegas. I could see the anxiety and so on. I'm just a little, little puzzled at this intense level of anger, an 11-year-old with huge anger issues. <clears throat> Husband has triglycerides at 275. And he mailed me your essential uh, red yeast rice. The bottle says to take four daily. Is that a right dose to lower it? Well, triglycerides, I would use more of the omega 800s or pantothene if you have elevated triglycerides. If he has elevated cholesterol, you can help to more naturally manage, keep healthier cholesterol levels with red yeast rice, steel cut oats, dietary changes. Really high triglycerides are often a reflection of too many whites, too many refines, too many carbs, too much rice, too much bread, that needs to be changed. Uh, also, is this taken all at one time? No. Should be taken with meal or evening. I would usually recommend either two at breakfast and dinner, ideally two at dinner <clears throat> and two at bed. It can help triglycerides. I'm not saying that it won't. Um, I, I think the omegas are an even key, more key player, but certainly you have them. You certainly can go ahead and incorporate them. We talked about early on that I think one of the ways that you learn to blunt some of the effects of stress, and not that we use the Word of God as, a, as, a, as some, as some you know, vending machine. We're going to put money in or we're going to get something out. No, this is about relationship with your Heavenly Father. And back in the book of Genesis, we see that God says to Adam, after Adam sins and they fall away, <clears throat> they literally run and hide from God. And God says, where are you? To me, it's a clear indicator of God's desire to fellowship with us. He created us for fellowship. He created us for worship. Many of us get caught up in the service portion, and that's great. But if it's done outside of fellowship, I believe it's an issue. Next, we see 
that we have a literal interpretation in the book of Isaiah as God's promise to preserve and save Zion, to preserve and save the people that he has called, the children and the people of Israel. But there's also a literal interpretation that you must be able to take out of that. But that word is for you and I that applies to us. Otherwise, then the Bible is not relevant. The Bible is relevant through all generations, through all ages, at all points in time. God is saying, if you are going to be unyielding to me and you want to be self-sufficient, it will take a toll on you. If you're going to light your own torch, be your own guardian, give yourself your own direction, you'll basically fall on your face. No, let me light your torch. Let me light your way. I will make provision. I will make protection for you. And lastly, I just want to end with this. Uh, Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of Matthew about worry. <clears throat> Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. This is the thing that we, I believe, as human beings, suffer from the most. Worry about tomorrow, about our children, about our families, about our work, about our finances, you name it, right? Our marriage, our relationship, it goes on. Jesus says, don't worry about your life. This is hard, this is hard to grasp. Or what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or what about your body, or what you will wear. Is not life more than food? The body more than clothes or raiment? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. And I'm just going to jump down here because we're going to close. But seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. We've got it backwards, I think. I worry too much about how I'm going to provide for my family, how I'm going to run my businesses, what I'm going to do for a show, what I'm going to do for a live stream. How am I going to stay fresh and relevant? I worry and I stress over these things. And God's saying, he's got to be saying to me at times, I know he is. I'm just not sometimes in the listening mode. Huge faux pas on my end. I'll take care of those things. You do this first. Get, don't get the cart before the horse. If you seek my kingdom first, you'll seek my righteousness first. Joe, I'm going to take care of these things. None of this is too difficult for me. If you'll just set your priorities aright. Let me be your torch. Let me light your path. Don't be self-sufficient. Let me take the reins of your life. I'll take care of the provision part. I'll see to it that you're taken care of. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. In other words, it's going to be there. And the difficulties we're going to confront, they're still going to be there. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And don't we already know that? God bless you. I hope that this has helped you. I believe that it will. I firmly believe it's not just one thing. It's not all just exercise. It's not all just trying to get better sleep and getting on sleep essentials. It's not just, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to change my diet. No, I believe it has to be a compilation of all of the things that we discussed. Work at this. I open with working at it, that you're having a level of commitment and knowing this is not going to be easy. It'll take time, but it's worth it. And ultimately, know that you've been created for fellowship. He wants relationship with you. Don't be self-sufficient. God hates self-sufficiency and our pride and us trying to take everything over in our own lives. And lastly, worry brutalizes us with this stress. And I know we're all going to worry to some degree, but if we can learn to start relinquishing the reins of our lives little by little, your coping mechanisms and the potential for you to move from the alarm to the resistance to the exhaustion phase becomes minimized. It'll preserve your health. You won't age as fast like these grays. Um, God bless you. I love doing this. I hope you're blessed. I'll see you on the next live stream.